Well, thank you all for joining us. This is sort of the first time that we're doing something like this. I'm uh, Rudy Vasquez, the Marketing and Communications Manager for the El Paso Downtown Management District. And this will be on our social if you're watching this or in the Insider Newsletter. And we just wanted to get the folks together from the El Paso Community Foundation and related cultural and arts organizations that are part of the uh, cultural roundtable that is a, uh, a, a part of the El Paso Community Foundation's uh, effort to uh, get those organizations together and to, to sort of work together to put that onto the community and you know do this through marketing and other initiatives like the Imagine El Paso <laughs> initiative, which just started and is an answer to COVID. And we just like to introduce everybody. So first we've got Stephanie Otero, and she is the El Paso Community Foundation Vice President of Operations, and uh, Katie Huron, which is the El Paso Community Foundation uh, Program Assistant. So thank you all for coming. And from our related organizations uh, through the cultural community, we have Christina Montoya Halter, the Communications and Marketing Manager for El Paso Water, and El Paso Water opened the Carlos M. Ramirez Tech H20 Water Resources Learning Center in 2008 promote water education, and that is a participant of the Cultural Roundtable. So thank you for being here. Daniel Carey, the Huelan Director of Centennial Museum and Chihuahuan Desert Gardens, and Ariane Marseille, the Executive Director for the El Paso Opera. And I'm sorry about that last one, Ariane. I'm not sure if I said that correct. Right. <laughs> um, really Nobody to... does. Don't worry. It's all right. <laughs> Marseille? Marse it's Marseille. Let's see. Oh. Just Marcy, okay. Easier than it looks, yeah. Yeah, I want to make it fancy. Um, <laughs> thank you for being here today. So thank I guess we'll just get started with Stephanie and Katie. Sure. And you all, um, if Stephanie want to take take us through the uh, initiative and the, I guess, getting off the ground with the cultural uh, roundtable. Absolutely. Um, so the El Paso Cultural Roundtable was formed in 2018 by the El Paso Community Foundation. Um, to create more collaborative um, efforts and partnerships between the cultural and arts organizations in our community. Um, the organizations were hoping to promote the importance of the arts in our community and improve their visibility within the community to attract new visitors to what they were offering. And in the initial pre-pandemic um, pieces of the, of the round table, they uh, created three different initiatives, including uh, a teacher night in downtown El Paso to show teachers all the wonderful offerings that they can bring the kids to. Um, and we were moving forward. And then just like everybody else in the whole world, really, um, the pandemic hit. And so when the round table met after the, the start of the pandemic and all of these institutions were no longer able to open their brick and mortar uh, locations for the community, um, as always, um, we as a, the El Paso community always come together to figure out how to move forward. And so each of the organizations individually were trying to figure out how they would still engage with the community. And then collectively, they wanted to see if they could work to get those messages out of what you can do with these organizations during the pandemic while their locations are still closed, and also stay in the forefront of, of people's minds um, for when we actually get to um, reopen. So we launched Imagine El Paso, and it's a collaboration amongst all of the cultural arts organizations in El Paso, um, really to stand together and remain seen as places of education, inspiration, and community, whether their doors are physically opened or closed. Um, the organizations are sharing the resources that hopefully will spark the imagination of both um, families, um, citizens, and then of course teachers who are looking for opportunities to engage with their classes during the pandemic. Thanks. Can you tell us a little bit about the thought process behind uh, Imagine El Paso? Because I noticed that there's sort of like a, a negative positive to it. You know, it's sort of Imagine Without and then there's Imagine With and how that all came together. I mean, what were you all thinking and how do we get to Imagine El Paso? I'm gonna let Katie take this one. Sure. So we were looking um, at the marketing that was going on during the pandemic, and there was a lot of messages, sort of remember when or we're still here. Um, and we wanted to, to tap into that and let El Paso know, don't forget about us because this pandemic will end and we'll still be here. Um, and it also sort of pulled um, at, at things like 
a lot of places all across the world were offering online resources. And so we wanted to um, let our teachers, let our parents know that they could tap into El Paso cultural organizations and didn't have to go to the Getty or didn't have to go to museums in New York to look for those online resources, that there was localized programming happening right here. And so imagine El Paso with or without these places, it's so vital to who we are, all the opera, the, muse the Centennial Museum, El Paso water, all of these things come together in that commonality of really creating a place that is culturally alive and well. And so imagine El Paso without those places, we just couldn't. And so that's where we formulated um, that campaign slogan. What were some of the things that you all asked the participants to sort of contribute to this and how did that all come together in a deliverable? Right. So there was this this campaign. Um, we didn't want to put extra work. Everyone was sort of already in that panic mode at the beginning and then um, finding their way. They already had programming currently happening. And so we didn't want to create extra work for them. This was just supposed to be um, something to elevate what they were already doing. And so, for example, I'm going to use Ariane's programming um, with the curbside opera and I'll let her speak to that program in just a minute. But it didn't have to be creating a new program. So when we do this campaign and talk about Imagine El Paso without, imagine El Paso without the stage. You don't have to, it's coming to you. And so then she would just tie in that programming that she's already doing and relating that campaign message right back to programs she's working hard to put on. That's great to hear. Can you all tell me, uh, you know, um, Ariane, Christina or even Daniel, what you all are doing in terms of programming, the, the tangible program that you're doing um, with, with the virtual options and what people would find if they're, you know, looking at the, uh, the campaign and saying, you know what, I think I need to kind of plug in our, our children, or even myself into something that engages me. Um, what are you all doing and, and how did that change? Let's see, I guess I'll jump in first. Um, you know, being a performing arts organization, we're a, a little different. We looked at it as what can we offer in a safe way, but keep it live, um, because live performance is just at the core of who we are. Um, and so, as Katie mentioned, we created our curbside opera programming where we were able to, in a socially distant manner, um, essentially have a traveling stage and a back of a pickup that we would perform out of. It's, it's like the most Texas idea I think we'd had, but it was a great success and it kind of propelled us through the summer and into the fall because it allowed us to stay present, it allowed us to be active, and also it allowed people to have that live element. And I know some of our other uh, music organizations, we're not alone in doing this. Uh, the symphony has created a, a, um, an outdoor, small, socially distanced effort as, as Pro Musica. But then the flip side is there are, um, we are doing some virtual programming. We had a live streamed concert and recital that we had in Octo earlier in October. We have another one coming up here soon. Um, and again, I know Pro Musica, UTEP Department of Music, Opera UTEP, all of those others are offering those virtual experiences. Um, it's not quite the same as being live, but certainly in this situation, it's, it's so valuable. Um, just to have a little counter programming to all of the scary stuff that we see in the news. I think we've all recognized how vital and important um, the art is to our everyday life and to our mental health and to our enjoyment and the quality of life. And so all of our, all of the performing arts organizations have, we have found kind of a, a way to to still reach our community. And I think the community has responded very um, positively showing that they value what we're offering as well. So I'll let you guys jump in with, with, uh, with your format as well. Daniel, yeah, I guess. Uh, oh, Christina, you wanna go ahead? Uh, sure, Daniel, thanks. So um, El Paso Water, you know, we have the, the lovely Tech H2O 
um, resources center that normally we would love to have people come in. We have thousands of, of students and, and parents come in every year, um, but because we can't and it's closed and then also a lot of our staff has been redirected um, to act as customer service agents right now to help out with a lot of people who are behind on their water bills who need assistance. Um, so we're doing that for the community, um, but in spite of that, we've decided to kind of do similar to what Ariane has mentioned, is that are really the water dropped presentations that we used to go inside schools. Instead of doing that, we went ahead and recorded some professional video series featuring really the water drop with important um, activities and even songs that kids can sing. And we posted them on our YouTube page. We're sharing them on Instagram. Um, and we are getting such tremendous feedback, especially from parents who have young children at home who are looking at activities, looking for things to do because they can't go out and about. So that was one of the ways that we directed um, ways of educating and informing the community. We also started sharing um, some just basic water activities on our Instagram pages, um, science related. Um, and, and speaking of that I have to say all of our other partners in STEAM, um, like the Zoo and like Insights, have been doing much of the same thing. They're offering online programs on their websites. Um, for example, I know that uh, the Zoo is offering their adventure programs online. Um, I know that they're even celebrating a lot of the animals' birthdays um, that I think people, you know, are really taking advantage of and keeping people engaged. Um, I know that Insights is doing the nerd nights from what I hear has been very successful. They're doing those on Zoom. They used to have them in person. Um, but again, it's keeping alive, you know, the science and the technology, the engineering, the arts um, and math, keeping that alive in these homes, just reaching them in different ways. So we're excited to be able to offering those programs. Um, and we're thankful for Imagine El Paso because we can keep reminding um, people that we're still here. We may not be here the way that we normally were, but we're still here to provide you those resources. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and I think that, um, uh, you know, museums are, are still alive. I mean, I think w we are probably the most kind of brick and mortar of, of, um, uh, of the entities, but, you know, we are constantly doing kind of outreach programming anyways. And so I think most of the museums in the city have kind of uh, shifted into the, the digital realm uh, through Facebook and Zoom. Um, but just, I just, you know, last week alone, you know, it's, there was something going on pretty much every night of the week last week um, when I looked on, on the, um, you know, the hashtag Imagine El Paso. If you just look on that on Facebook or Instagram and you just see all the things that are going on. So the art and the history museum we're doing at Dia de los Muertos. Um, events, several several of them, uh, the Tom Lee Institute, um, who, who, you know, they're already not brick and mortar, but, you know, they had Tom Lee month last month, and uh, they did a lot of exceptional programming throughout the month. The McGoffin Home, uh, one of my personal favorites, because um, they just do these great, they have a brown bag series and a book talk that they've been doing for a long time anyways, they just transitioned virtually. I don't know if they were doing, they, they have a make a thing um, session uh, uh, virtually now. I don't know if they were doing that before, but it really works um, in just the kitchen of one of their interpreters, you know, so uh, they've done a great job. Uh, one of my favorites this last couple weeks was the Holocaust Museum, uh, had a whole series on, um, and I was going to try to get this guy's name, Chune. Sugihara. He was a, 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 a diplomat to a Japanese diplomat to Lithuania who saved thousands of Jews during the Holocaust. And they did a book talk um, and a film series and uh, brought in a film scholar, all virtual, um, all in different formats. You know, so I really think that the El Paso museums have upped their game to reaching out. And the Centennial Museum, of course, is in there. Um, the Nerd Night series that Christina mentioned is, is our collaborative series we've been doing for the, almost uh, next month will be um, the three year anniversary we've been doing with the Insight Science Center. Last Friday was Candy. Um, so we had 
chefs coming in and talking about how to make candy, um, kind of the, the, all the nerdy things you know about candy, right? The distribution and kind of production of candy. But then of course we had um, someone from the medical center talking about how it affects our body, <laughs> things <laughs> here on Halloween, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, that series we, we do every month and that has moved virtually with success. Uh, we also, it's just collaboration. I think we've just been collaborating more and more. We collaborated with the Rubin, with the Rubin Center on campus for the UTEP Arts Alive series that was very successful in, in October. And, and so it, and I, and I just want to thank the the, the um, El Paso Community Foundation because you know I think that we've all been working together um, you know for the past years, but they've they've just been the center that's holding us together, and and especially through this campaign and and into the future um, when we do open hopefully uh, here soon, uh, they'll continue to play that role too. So we really appreciate all the work that Stephanie and Katie did, but it's just been great to have all these partnerships and collaborations. Daniel, I'm jealous of your uh, natural light. DMD has me down here. You <laughs> look like I've got a spray tan on. I really have no window. Um, so that's a good point though, the collaboration. Do you guys feel that, uh, you know, with the inception of the you know, the Cultural Roundtable and the El Paso Community Foundation uh, doing this. Has, this. has this situation sort of catalyzed that collaboration, whereas before we kind of were in our own silos and then getting together, um, has this sort of created a, a new, I guess, uh, uh, you know, creating just a new culture for the community in terms of arts and culture to, to get together more? Because, I mean, this seems like there's lots of communication and there's lots of teamwork and getting those deliverables out there? You know, I, I absolutely, because, you know, I think all of us in theory wanted to work with other people or know what was going on or perhaps support each other and collaborate in different ways. But in amongst everything we do as, you know, leading nonprofits in the cultural world can be a little overwhelming and, you know, one man band syndrome. You can't always make those connections. You can't always reach out or know who to reach out to. And so um, when the Community Foundation started this, more than anything, it created a community and an opportunity to network. And so all of a sudden, you didn't wonder who was in charge of XYZ because that person was there as well and you could make those connections. And so as far as networking and in information for each other, it's been extremely helpful. And then they've done other things like uh, something It sounds simple and yet it wasn't having a shared calendar where we could all upload all of our own events. You know, some in performing arts, I have events all year round. Well, I don't want to have events at the same time that the museum is having a, a festival or the symphony is having a concert instead of having to make those 40 phone calls or 40 emails to establish what days might be free we have a shared calendar and we can all collaborate on that to make sure that we're not scheduling on top of each other. And again, that sounds very simple and yet it's not. And it is so valuable for us to have. And so having the, having the community foundation facilitate all of that communication and all of those things um, really is only to the benefit of all of our organizations, but also El Paso as a whole. Can we speak to the challenges of the arts and culture? I, I know that, especially as we move forward with technology, um, competing with, uh, you know, people and kids watching Minecraft games on YouTube, where they're not even participating. Um, how did you combat that before, and how do you feel the arts and community uh, tackle these challenges when it comes to just getting in the forefront and saying, hey, you know what, art's important, history is important. Um, even something as uh, you know simple as as water being something that we, we should know more about and how it contributes to our lives. Um, you know, can you speak to those challenges a little bit? 
Well, I, I, I can actually say that I think, and I, I say this a lot um, just in our regular outreach, um, is that um, I think the pandemic has been an opportunity. It's had a little bit of a silver lining that so many people are on social media and on YouTube, and um, we're reaching probably a lot of people that we didn't reach before. I mean, it was great to do these in-person um, Willie the Water Drop visits in schools, um, but we couldn't reach, we, we had a very limited amount that we could reach, but this way we're reaching thousands. Um, I think a lot of people are, are on their phones more, they're looking at these videos, they're looking for ways to connect. So they're finding us. Um, and in, in doing so, they're looking at some of our other messaging about where our water comes from, how to conserve. We made a whole other series of how to conserve water videos. Um, and we're finding that people are, are really engaging with them um, and interacting with us and asking questions. Um, so I, I think it's really an opportunity that we've seized uh, over at El Paso Water. Yeah, I, I was gonna say the same thing, Christina, I love it, the silver lining. I, I, I think it's kind of forced us, you know, museums have been trying to do this uh, you know, to engage people virtually more, um, probably over the last, well, I'd say 20 years, and um, not just in El Paso, but all over the world, right? And so now um, we are, uh, and, and, and I think that we're, it's kind of forced us to, one of the things that we're hoping to to unveil and uh, probably is going to be in the new year um, in January or February is our virtual Lacans. We have this amazing um, uh, Lakong. It's a, a, a Buddhist temple um, in the Bhutanese uh, st architectural style in the center of campus. We oversee that as uh, part of the museum and we're creating this virtual tour where you can walk around it, walk <clears throat> inside it, you can learn about it. And so we're going to be able to reach, you know, you know, because because right now we only open it four days out of the month. Uh, or five days out of the month, actually, um, to preserve it. So, you know, a small amount of people who are on campus at that time are going to be able to kind of come in and see it. But now, once we get this virtual going, we're going to reach millions. Um, and, I, and I say millions in part because I know we're partnering with the Smithsonian uh, institution uh, since that's, you know, it was on the mall um, originally for the the um, Folk Life Festival in 2008, but um, you know they're they're partnering with us, and of course they have a huge reach. But you know I think it's just yeah that's the silver lining is we're we're really being forced to kind of get material out there, and now we're seeing that look the audience isn't just El Paso Juarez you know the region it is um, it's the world it's pretty cool. Thanks, Daniel. To wrap up a little bit, I'm sorry. I, I don't want to interrupt you, Ariane. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, no, I was going to say, I, I do echo both of, of what they're saying. And I think, again, from a performing arts perspective, I think that um, we, we have hopefully a community and a population now that recognizes the value of performing arts. Because if you think back to the first couple months of the pandemic, what was everybody finding comfort in? It was all of those musicians and artists and performers that were offering their free content because it was a way to soothe our fears and our souls and, and all of those things. And so I am very, very hopeful that coming out of this, that we have greater, uh, people are playing, uh, placing greater value on that experience. But I will say to speak to the challenges that, um, you know, talking again of opera, uh, live opera is a very grand, absorbing event. It's not just something for your ears, but for your eyes and your emotions. And, and um, opera is grand, everything about it. Um, translating that into a virtual event is difficult, and especially difficult for a small company, because we are no longer trying to stage something live. We have become, out of necessity, TV producers. And we're a very small organization and we have very small um, resources when it comes to the technology that we're able to use. And so it is the biggest challenge for us is then shifting to what we want to offer everyone, but also having it look how people expect it to look 
when it's online. Um, it's just a totally different, again, it's, it's a shift to being more of a, a, you know, television content production and, and things like that. And, and so those challenges are, are daunting for a small organization like this. And it takes a whole different approach to budgeting and hiring and planning and all of those things. And so there's exciting elements to it. Absolutely. And um, our first live stream event was us dipping our toe in the water and we got it to work and that was a great success. And, and we're going to keep learning, which is what keeps, I think the art alive and vibrant and relevant but it's challenging and it's hard. And, and so all of this is wrapped up together. So luckily we can see both, we do see both sides of that coin. I think it's comforting for lots of people to hear that it's challenging for, for you. And I think we're all going to be the same experiences. Yeah, no, thank you, Adriana, for mentioning that. Like, <laughs> it, it is challenging too, right? We totally skirted the question, right? Oh no, it's all, all great. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm not thinking not blunt. <laughs> no, you'll you've picked up these skills now, and and like I said, I think going into right. the future, everybody, it's it's all going to be virtual. Will be there even past the pandemic. Absolutely, so I think that's that I is think, a plus. You know, right? There's the so many thing things that the, all of our organ. Go ahead, go ahead. Dan. I was going to say the real thing is going to be even more important when we can go to it. Right to go. Yeah go to a museum and see the real thing, the, to hear the real thing, right? Like experience it, that's gonna be even more important when we come back. Absolutely, and I do think there's lots of ways, there's so many things that all of our organizations have adapted right now that we're gonna keep because we have noticed their, their effectiveness and everything. And so, you know, necessity is a motherhood of invention and we're experiencing that. It's a hard transition, but it doesn't mean that it's not going to have a wonderful byproduct at the end. And um, for things like opera, it keeps us relevant. It keeps us current. And that's a good thing. So. so to wrap up and to remind, you know, not just the children, but adults, parents, um, even professionals, how important the arts and culture is to us as individuals, can you all kind of recall the moment that, uh, whether it's pop culture, culture or history has sort of impacted you and sort of changed your life. I mean, whether you were five, 16 or 22, remind us what it was that sort of made a, a difference in your life and, and this sort of spectrum of things that we tend to forget in our daily lives. I'll start. Um, and I think this, just tying it back to the Imagine El Paso campaign, this is what's so, beautiful about it, right? We're inviting El Pasoans to imagine with us the cultural organizations. And so to your point, um, you know, something that I did with my siblings when I was young, um, we would put on shows. And so I hope that there's someone out there in El Paso who saw a curbside opera show and then went home and wanted to perform an opera show for their family. <laughs> and we did the whole bit, we sold tickets. My older sister was there turning the lights, we'd hang a sheet. And so I hope, um, you know, like you said, not just the kids get to imagine, but the parents. And then when this is all over and you can say, imagine or remember when, um, we actually had the opportunity to put on a show. Now let's go see one as a family. And so I think, that's the whole point of this Imagine um, campaign is that there's no limit to imagination. There's no age limit. And this will continue, we're hoping, beyond pandemic where we're, we're not having to sit in a closed room, um, imagining what it would be like when it's over. When, it's, when it finally is, we can go out there and experience these things again and let our imagination continue to grow. Do you have scalpers from the kid down the street for your show? <laughs> we did. We did. Stephanie, <laughs> did you have anything that sort of impacted your life growing up? Sure. So, so I wanted to share two things. One, for me growing up, we did Sunday symphony concerts in the park um, with my parents. Um, and it was something we looked forward to do in the summers and it was at the zoo. And so there was sort of this double experience where you got to spend the day at the zoo and then bring your picnic and have dinner and the symphony would play. And you know, those are the kind of experiences I wanted to have with my kids. Um, but what, what, what is funny to me in this sort of virtual world is we are also all working from home. You know, just the other day, my son was watching 
video. I think it was either on insights or maybe it was on HU. I don't know. But the next thing I know, he comes running into my zoom meeting, asking me for baking soda. And I was like, do I leave my room and figure out what he's going to do with that baking soda? <laughs> because he had seen an experiment online and was actively ready to do it on our front porch with that baking soda, to make something <laughs> explode. Um, and so I'm thankful for the joy that the organizations in El Paso are bringing into our lives as we're all in our homes, um, being community members as we try to, um, you know, I guess, flatten the curve in our community. And so I'm super thankful. While I didn't grow up in El Paso, so my experience at the zoo was, was in a different city, I am thankful for, like Katie said, that all that these organizations are doing to bring joy to our lives during this time. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, very common in the museum profession to like, what was your first museum experience? And, and my, my memory was actually with a natural history museum, I'm, even though I'm a trained historian, but El Paso is the only natural history uh, museum in El Paso. Um, and I, I do remember, I grew up in the Kansas City area going up to the University of Kansas and they had this be exhibited at a hive, um, uh, an, uh, an active hive, and they had these little tunnels that went from the hive to go outside. And you know, just really remembered that um, experience kind of, uh, at, you know, that field trip, getting on the bus, right? All those things that our kids do and unfortunately are not happening, <laughs> you know, right? Mm. But we currently have an ants exhibit up. Um, we worked with the biodiversity collection on um, this great exhibit that we opened up on Valentine's Day last year. Um, and, uh, or still this year, I guess, 2020, <laughs> a, a month before the pandemic, Absolutely. you know, shut us down. But um, it's, it's called Tiny Tunnels, um, Hidden Connections. And it, it's all about, we opened on Valentine's Day because it's all about re ant relationships, both with humans and other animals, you know, symbiotic relationships, um, parasitic relationships. So we're really kind of featuring, featuring that, but it's very interactive and we do have it online. We've transitioned online and we're actually um, working right now to um, to like uh, digit um, do a 360 tour um, uh, with it. So that should be up by this February. We're going to kind of have a relaunch a year later. <laughs> um, but you know, just the, those and, and really get it out there to the the K through 12 population, uh, especially. Um, because it's just so important to have those resources. And, and th those are just such important experiences, those field trips uh, when you're a kid to, to a museum. And, and I know that our kids will have that in the future, but it's kind of sad that it's not happening now, so. Yeah, for me, it was always um, music. Music like was just something always present at our house, both from classical, from playing piano for a long time, um, but also just um, pop pop culture and, and things. And it was always the immersive experience. I remember the first musical I ever went to at the Abraham Chavez Theater and just being um, enthralled. I remember all the, the rock concerts or just any time when I was there and it felt like it was surrounding you. So even the air you breathed uh, during the during the performance was part of the experience um, and just that whole immersive experience. And just again, it's, I, it's probably um, I took a circuitous route to opera, but it does make sense because it's the same type of um, immersive, full full sensory experience, and um, it just it transports you to somewhere else. And so I just, I always love that. I've always loved that. And again, it makes me, I'm sorry? You ever been to a Queen concert? I have not, I have not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and again, it, all of those things that make you wistful for what we had and just um, eager and hopeful for when we can get back there. The virtual is wonderful in the meantime, but yeah, to be able to experience that with others and breathe that air, it, I look forward to it. So, thanks, Ariane. Christina, let's round it out. 
Wow. Well, I don't know how I can follow all of those examples, but uh, I'll give it a shot. So I loved Sesame Street growing up. Um, and I tried to get my, my boys, my older one did, but the younger one, unfortunately, the older one was already watching cartoons and didn't get as much Sesame Street. Just singing along with the characters and learning at the same time was so exciting. Uh, you know, the count, the, the counting, I loved those songs. <laughs> I still sing them. I love them. But I guess where I'm going is I'm excited that we're able to do a similar thing with Wooly the Water Drop now. And I was so excited. You know, many of you know my background is, you know, former TV news and I've done a lot of video production. So to be able to do more video production right now is so exciting for me. I love <laughs> being able to be, you know, directing and, and doing these kinds of things. So it's that's where I say it's the silver lining because we're doing so many more videos than we ever did before. See, we um, need you over here. <laughs> We need help. I'm, I'm really happy to help. I, I love doing it. I love writing scripts. Uh, but my point is, is that what a great way for us to connect with all of these kids at home. You know, I know many of them aren't watching Sesame Street or any of those things anymore, but if we can give them an option to learn about water and where it comes from, to learn about science all the time while having fun and singing and interacting with a big blue water drop. I mean, it's, it's just, it's great. How do you give direction? You just say, feel wetter, feel fluid. Well, Willie <laughs> has his own voice and he, he talks and he dances. And Motivation. Yeah, yeah he's. he's <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had that job. That sounds fun. It's fun. Uh, I've thanks. never actually been inside the Willie costume, but oh. I've heard it's quite fun. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all for coming today and uh, for speaking with each other and uh, the public. You know, I think it's important to remind them how important arts and culture is and how you all are working really hard as everyone else is to sort of solve these challenges that we have this year. And, and hopefully this doesn't last too much longer. But uh, in the meantime, we're gonna continue pressing on. And uh, I think, what is the uh, website, uh, Stephanie or Katie, for more information on the Cultural Roundtable and in particular, this Imagine El Paso camp? Sure, so we just wanna invite the public to imagine with us um, there are a list of organizations that are participating in this roundtable, and you can find that at epcf.org backslash imagine, capital E, capital P. Um, and I just want to say that there's something for everybody on that list. The Art Museum and the History just did a poetry contest for Dia de los Muertos. There's STEM, there's experiments, there's museums. There's so many things, there's music. Um, so whatever your um, focus or passion is, this group has it. And again, we just invite you to, to join us. It's epcf.org backslash Imagine EP. Thank you all so much for your time. Yeah, thank you, we really appreciate it. Thank yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, all have a good day and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Great, thank you. Bye.